All right, well, welcome back. Um, welcome to uh, our series today. We're going to be talking about can building science help us slow COVID-19. This is actually a follow-up to a session we did back in April, so really exciting. Um, this course is approved for one hour continuing ed, GBCI, AIBD, BPI, non-whole house, uh, among um, AIA, uh, health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, today, I will be your moderator. As always, my name is Brett Little, and I'm here with the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Again, the question we're going to ask is, um, can our buildings help us or harm us uh, in regards to the spread of COVID-19 and dive into that today a little bit further. Big thanks to our top tier sponsor um, for putting the session on, um, Build Equinox, featuring their uh, not so new anymore, Serve 2 smart ventilation system. Um, this, uh, unlike traditional ERVs or HRVs, it features many qualities of a smart balance ventilation and feedback monitoring. Uh, with a standard ERV or HRV, you get constant low airflow rate with no relation to actual indoor air quality or occupancy. Uh, as you can see here, for the first three days when the home is occupied, the air quality is poor. The ERV just can't keep up. When occupants leave on vacation, the ERV keeps ventilating and wasting energy. Since the serve actually monitors air quality, it ventilates only when it needs to. Compared to an ERV, the SERP can ventilate up to 300 CFM, quickly purging pollutants from the home. When no ventilation is needed, the SERP can recirculate and unify the home, providing some additional heating or cooling dehumidification in an energy efficient manner. The SERP does this by monitoring both CO2 and uh, volatile organic compounds um, to determine when ventilation is necessary. Uh, many of these gases, we can't detect them, can't smell them, can't see them. So the serve is quietly in the background monitoring these and exhausting them uh, as necessary, suiting your client's lifestyle and needs. And instead of an ERV exchange core, the serve uses a high efficiency heat pump to exchange energy between incoming supply and outgoing air. What does this mean? Conditioned, comfortable air that unifies the home instead of dragging exterior rooms away from comfort. Uh, bonus that you can add on a MERV 13 um, with the unit as well for fill, uh, filtration needs. The SERP is manufactured right in Urbana, Illinois, with the entire facility being powered 100% by solar. And SERP works really well with some of our other um, sponsors, uh, such as the heat pump water heater from Reem Prestige to boost its capacity or work with Radiant, uh, such as uh, the mini split systems from Mitsubishi uh, to help distribute air around a home or multifamily unit, and as well as their GeoBoost, which works really well um, with our friends at Water Furnace um, for geothermal. And real exciting to see available now as an add-on or added on to any existing units uh, in place already, uh, UV lights that can kill bacteria and viruses. So uh, check out the serve 2 at buildequinox.com today. And then also a thanks to our other sponsor, um, Ava Windows. All right, well, welcome back. Our regular guest here on the show, on the webinar, uh, Dr. Ty Newell. Ty is a co-owner, co-founder of Build Equinox, a company devoted to inventing technologies for healthy, comfortable, and sustainable living. Ty lives in a 100% solar-powered home in Urbana, Illinois, that features automated fresh air control, the CRV, uh, two electric vehicles, and is the first home with an Illinois municipality to be, to be permitted for rainwater harvesting use. So with that, Ty, uh, welcome back. Love to have you again, and please do take it away. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Brett. Let's see uh, if I can get everything organized here. You know, is uh, let's see. All right. So I think uh, yeah, it looks like things will move along here. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time out to join us. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, this is kind of an odd time, as Brett mentioned, in the spring, in April, we had a, a similar webinar, but that was at a time as we were rushing into isolating and trying to understand what was going on, what we needed to do. Uh, and since that time, uh, but still in the midst of it and still really in the very early stages of this disease, but now with much more knowledge as far as the capability to predict, capability to understand the transmission mechanisms. And so 
we're coming uh, to you with that in mind that while we're not in control, we are understanding what's needed, how human behavior needs to change, how it impacts things. Uh, Brett did a nice job of telling you about us, so I won't go on, but I do want to mention in the words of the very wise Aldo Leopold, uh, how do we live on a piece of land without spoiling it? That's what drives us um, in these things. If you get one thing out of this message, this is it. Carbon dioxide, measure it in any building you go in, where you live, where you work, where you meet others, public gathering spaces, you'll learn a lot. This simple table down below, if you measure carbon dioxide, you know the fresh air flow rate. And the more fresh air flow that's going into a building, the better your brain's going to function, the lower the probability you're going to get sick and the healthier you're going to be. And today's buildings by today's ventilation standards mostly operate around 1,000 to 1,200 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And that, by the rule of thumb, uh, many of you may be um, familiar with, is about 20 cubic feet per minute of airflow, fresh airflow per person. And that airflow may be intended through a fresh, fresh air ventilation system or unintended through construction flaws and flue vents and other things that by infiltration allows air in. But without having to go around and measure airflow, which is very difficult to do at lower airflow uh, levels, carbon dioxide is a great tracer gas for telling us relative to our respiration uh, how much fresh air is coming in, and the concentration of contagion, as we'll talk about, is directly related to the amount of CO2 that's coming out of our lungs. And the level that we recommend, and I'll give you some background on that, is 800 parts per million, which basically is double the airflow rate that most ventilation standards would have you operate at. And we'll talk about the cost consequence of that. It's very minor, especially in respect to your health. And it's a reasonable level. But notice that as you go from 800 to 600, you double again. And from 600 to 500, you double again. There is such a thing as too much fresh air, as nice as being outside is, where in effect you have infinite fresh air and zero contagion concentration. And 40 seems to be a good sweet spot, not just for COVID, but for flus, cold, and other uh, things that impact us. So this outline, we'll talk about six guidelines that we've formulated, and you can read in more depth from our newsletter at buildequinox.com, and background references for the reason behind these guidelines. And then we'll discuss some aspects of virus transmission, the airborne debate that most likely you've heard about now through various news outlets. And then something that uh, we've developed as a modeling parameter for how this disease spreads called the infection parameter, but a very simple parameter conceptually that gives us some um, say a, a, a reference point for understanding if infections are growing or decreasing. And then two things related to human behavior that the infection parameter depends on. A social distance index, which is an independent index that you can look up online and it tells us basically how often you're going out of your house, how far you're going out of your house, whether you're going shopping to work or other things. And that has an impact on disease transmission, along with a transmission efficiency parameter. And then finally, how human behavior relates to both of those things. So that as you hear different things about masks, about distancing, what I hope to do is convey to you that there is a quantitative background that's now being established that helps us understand if we do this amount of isolation, 
if we do this amount of practice as far as what uh, mask wearing, what that can mean as far as reducing our chances of getting sick. And as someone who's old and decrepit, and um, as well as most of my friends, that uh, we're very concerned about this, as you might suspect. And uh, and so, um, so we're trying to understand how to keep a large segment of our populace safe. And uh, a year ago, I was in England. I visited the Florence Nightingale Museum. I think she was a brilliant person, uh, way ahead of her time. And her words speak true today as they did back more than 100 years ago. Keep the air the patient breathes as pure as the external air. Uh, this museum happened to have a special exhibit on the Spanish flu, which was very well done. And when we get to travel again safely, um, I very much recommend visiting that museum. It's a nice quiet spot in London, so get you out of the hubbub of all the other tourist attractions. We want people to think beyond energy. Too often we see the focus of you know, hundreds of projects we've been involved in. Often the focus is solely on energy, but buildings are not designed for energy savings. They're designed to keep us safe, to keep us comfortable, to keep us healthy. And energy is simply a constraint. We live in a sea of energy. And now that we have the renewable energy means of harvesting energy, as we do at our business, as I do at my house, that uh, energy worries, uh, it's a cost concern, but it's not a worry like it was with the oil embargoes of the 1970s. Keeping carbon dioxide, as I mentioned, is important at work, at home, at school. And the great thing is that a healthy home and a business doesn't have to sacrifice energy efficiency or cost more than conventional, and we'll look at that. So these reopening guidelines, I don't like testing any more than anyone else. I don't like wearing face masks, but I do because uh, even here where there's four of us working in our business and we have enough space to spread around, that uh, one of us has elderly grandparents that live nearby, another one has a grandmother who lives with her parents in town. Uh, and then just as far as my own uh, health and safety. And so we do wear masks here at work, even though it is a fairly casual place and, uh, and with plenty of room to spread around and is actively smart ventilated and kept below 800 parts per million of carbon dioxide. So number one is to and ensure that you have enough fresh air ventilation to maintain low carbon dioxide levels. Second, filter, recirculate air. We see too many homes without air recirculation. And for some reason, uh, there's some house design standards and building design standards that are recommending against recirculation. Recirculation is critical to every building, but you must filter that air. The purpose of recirculation is to filter particles and most particles in a high performance building, as well as a low, are generated indoors. You're not going to keep uh, an indoor environment particle free if you're only filtering outdoor air. And we recommend MERV 13 or 16. And MERV 16 is equivalent to a HEPA. So HEPA level is also good. And then add ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. As Brett mentioned, uh, we now incorporate that as a feature in our system. And it's something we've been working on for the last two years. It, it was just happenstance that the pandemic came through as we were releasing that. But uh, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation is a very effective means to kill a variety of microbes, from viruses to bacteria to other types of spores and contagions that, uh, and, and things that impact our respiratory health. We, um, we also recommend beyond that for public gathering spaces, schools, businesses, that ultraviolet germicidal irradiation 
but use for surface sanitizing, that this is another important tool to help get rid of, uh, to reduce the probability of getting an infectious dose by touching an object laden with the virus or bacteria. And we recommend staff and customers, as we do here, uh, I'm in an isolated room right now, so I've taken my mask off, but it's right here with me, uh, that, um, that you wear face masks when you're around a gathering of people that you don't know very well or where they've been or what their habits are. And when you encounter people without masks out in public, stay away from them. Six feet is a myth. You're now hearing that more strongly from CDC and other officials, but we know that uh, a cloud of infectious particles travels much more than six feet away. And we'll discuss that a bit more. Healthy buildings and homes. Um, this kind of triad of bringing in fresh air, air filtration and air purification or sanitization that they each are focusing perhaps in their own areas, fresh air, it improves your productivity, it improves your brain function, areas such as decision-making, focus, concentration, organization of information, uh, sleep, all of these important uh, factors to your productivity are impacted by fresh air. And its main thing is to get good fresh air in, but also to dilute microbes and, and chemicals that are in the air. Air filtration, its primary pur purpose is to remove particulates, not just microbial ones, but say inert particulates like asbestos that the shape of the particle gets locked in and the cilia in your uh, respiratory system aren't able to bring it up like say more roundish type particles are brought up and out of your uh, respiratory system. And your body, even though it may be chemically inert, still treats it as a foreign body that it's going to attack and inflame. And this inflammation, this attack, may create localized infectious and inflammations that are harmful to your lungs and respiratory system. But in addition, when your body is inflamed, you're producing things like cortisol, the, the, the fight or flight uh, uh, chemical that keeps you on edge. And this is hard on your heart, it's hard on your circulatory system. And, um, and while we don't directly know the causation, we do see strong correlation of things like heart attack and stroke with particulate levels. And air purification, using something like ultraviolet which has been known for many decades, nearly a hundred years, as a strong source of purifying air, as well as water, that it deactivates many types of microbes. And even though these may not be effectively put together, uh, we're constantly battling in the projects we work on with folks who think they have a leaky home so their air quality must be good because they're just inundated with fresh air. But our experience from testing many, many homes, uh, high performance, leaky homes, is that even the leakiest home doesn't have good air quality in all spaces throughout that house. And the bedroom is typically quite well sealed and the place where the worst air quality is located which also impacts your quality of sleep. This is what we would like to see as people design a home. They bring these three tools, these three methods together, and that the intersection of all three of these is what results in a healthy home. And in some cases, for example, uh, air purification with ultraviolet or some other means, that's not going to reduce particulates, but Air filtration does reduce particulate, uh, particulates that are laden with microbes, and that helps on air purification. And fresh air dilutes microbes. And so this relation up at the top shows how a compounding effect uh, between fresh air dilution, F fresh is the fraction of airflow within a building that's fresh air, 
So if 50% is recirculated air and 50% is fresh air, and as I mentioned, recirculated air is important uh, in order to get indoor generate particulates out of the air. And that this in combination with a filter that might remove 90% of particulates in a range where the particulates are small and perhaps microbe laden or microbes themselves, and then an ultraviolet or other sanitizing type method that can uh, contribute another way to kill and inactivate a virus or a bacteria. And when you put these together, that microbes could be reduced to a very, very tiny fraction of what currently is existing in many buildings today. But what's the cost? Well, we'll discuss it. And, and, uh, and the good news is that it's very, very reasonable. It's very low. But we need to consider some other ways as far as how to justify it. The importance of fresh air. Professor Milton, currently at the University of Maryland, but formerly of Harvard when he did this study, investigated uh, a company with over 3,000 employees scattered over several buildings. And what he was looking for was how ventilation impacted sick days. You see that this was done nearly 20 years ago, well before COVID. And in a study that by sorting through buildings that had say standard ventilation, about 20 cubic feet per minute per person to doubling that to 40 to 50, that the reduction of sick days was about 40%, and that's basically one sick day per employee per year with about a $500 value. And, uh, and the cost to increase ventilation that much without any energy recovery uh, features built in, just simply turning up the fan, opening up dampers, that it was less than $50 per employee relative to the $500 sick day reduction. And in comparison, uh, this increase in fresh air, which also has beneficial cognition and employee productivity effects, that uh, uh, this is equivalent to the flu vaccine effectiveness um, in a given year. Now, as I mentioned, CO2 is extremely important. It tells us how much contagion is in the air because CO2 comes from our lungs and contagions come from our lungs. And this plot, also from another paper by Professor Milton, who's very prolific, and as you may have heard on the news about the airborne debate with CDC, that people are getting infected from virus particles floating around in the air. He was the co-author of that letter to the CDC and the World Health Organization signed by nearly 300 scientists, epidemiologists, and medical professionals stating to the CDC and WHO they need to start paying attention to airborne mechanisms. But this uh, is from a model that I've used that came from another uh, Professor Milton paper with Professor Rudnick, uh, also when uh, Milton was at Harvard, and it basically correlated the probability of getting sick with um, carbon dioxide concentration and time exposure. Time uh, exposed to an infectious person is very important. And what you can see in this is that as carbon dioxide goes up, the fraction of contagion that's in the air goes up and the amount that's needed to make you sick an infectious dosage goes up. And, and so basically, if you're in a, in a building with one infectious and three uninfected persons, but susceptible, that if you're at about a 1200 part per million carbon dioxide concentration for an eight hour workday period, you're, you're basically quite certain to get that contagion. 95% plus, you're going to get sick. If you knock it down to about 800 parts per million, at least you've got a fighting chance over an eight hour period of not getting sick. We're gonna look at this in a little bit different light as we consider face masks and filters, but the, the impact and the use of carbon dioxide to give you some insight into the quality of the air is very important, very simple, very cost effective. So two other tools, filtration 
And filters, uh, we need to be considering them in a different light. And if you've visited big box stores, you've seen the run on filters that some of them are limiting you to maybe only two MERV 13, MERV 16 filters. You need at least a MERV 11, but preferably we recommend a MERV 13 or 16 to get 85 to 95% of microbe laden particulates out of the air. A MERV 8 in a study by Professor Brent Stevens at Illinois Institute of Technology in, an, uh, re in a residence uh, type of laboratory study, circulating air with a typical air handler found that a MERV-8 was equivalent to not having any filter at all. You need to get to MERV-11 and, and preferably 13 or 16 to get viral-laden microbes out of the air as well as bacteria. And then other things, uh, out west we see folks uh, using carbon filters as forest fires unfortunately have been damaging the outdoor air environment. And carbon filters, uh, not only can you get the smoke particulates, but the smoke odors, the VOCs, that they're uh, useful for removing that smell. And there's now VOC filters that specialize on things like a fish smell or kitty litter odors. And and this one that I'm showing uh, happens to change color as it gets laden with a VOC. And so uh, filters, while expensive, they're very, very important in this battle uh, to protect our health in homes and something that shouldn't be neglected, something that should be made easy to replace, not something you have to crawl up in an attic or, or bend underneath uh, in order to get into uh, to change the filter and ultraviolet purification um, our ultraviolet bulb supplier their phones are ringing off the hook they can't get them uh, soon enough and where we used to get them immediately uh, it's now a good three to four week delay but ultraviolet deactivates microbial matter uh, with uh, about 0.02 watts of ultraviolet per CFM of airflow. There's a single pass kill efficiency of 85%. Using an ultraviolet in aluminum ducts uh, with aluminum surfaces as we do in, in our application reflects about 90, 95% of the ultraviolet radiation, unlike galvanized steel ducts, which will only reflect about 50%. And so uh, how you use it's very important. But this basically um, results in for uh, say 200 cubic feet per minute, the airflow that we run for typical fresh air supply, about an 18 watt electric power bulb, and that's about five cents per day of operation. So let's look at this carbon dioxide plot and what we're recommending in our guidelines a little bit differently. This is using the same model I mentioned before, but now that model relating carbon dioxide uh, with different airflow levels. And so carbon dioxide is in the background of this modeling. And we see, uh, now this is residential as far as ASHRAE 62.2 2010, which is the ASHRAE standard that is lower in airflow rate for residences than 62.2 2019, the more current one. But 2010 is important because many municipalities, as well as things like EPA AirSense, uh, allow 2010 to be used. And then the typical rule of thumb, something that ASHRAE 62.1 would tend to point you toward for many commercial building applications, nominally about 20 cubic feet per minute per person. So that red circle shows you where you would be as far as the probability of getting infected with the same one infected individual with three susceptibles. This chart changes as you add more infected people or less relative to the susceptibles because the concentration of contagion in the carbon dioxide changes. And then it assumes that uh, the, the infected person is shedding quanta of, and a quanta is an infectious dose and 100 quanta per hour coming out of somebody's respiratory system seems to be in the range where the SARS-CoV-2 virus 
the virus that causes the COVID-19 disease, roughly where um, uh, people are shedding it, similar to influenza, even though a much, much different disease. You're basically assured over an eight hour period in this situation that you're going to get sick. You're going to catch the disease. And as we've seen in restaurants, in school situations, in choirs, on buses, in airlines, that this is what in fact is happening with this type of ventilation or worse. When you improve the ventilation, you see a significant drop for an eight hour exposure time. If you then add filtration with a similar level of airflow, so in this example, about 90 CFM through a MERV-13 relative to about 110 CFM of fresh air being brought in uh, for this uh, person, 120 CFM, excuse me, of uh, fresh air flow for four people. And then adding ultraviolet with the level of ultraviolet power for an 85% kill efficiency that these three guidelines knock you down to 50%, which is much better than essentially a certainty that you're going to get sick uh, with standard airflow and standard filtration, MERV-8, and then no sanitation. When we add the additional guidelines of wearing face masks and uh, and to, to this relation. What a face mask does on this basis, the cloth mask that most of us are wearing as unfortunately bi-directional masks, such as an N95 that medical professionals, it's essential for them to have. And it should be available like it used to be for us in any big box store at about a buck a mask. What we use for woodworking and other particulate laden uh, activities, but unfortunately there's a shortage of right now. But with the cloth, cloth masks, they're very effective and essential. They keep about 50% of the contagion out of the airstream, and so it basically takes that 100 quanta per hour that an infected person may be putting out, and knocks it down to 50 quanta of infectious doses per hour. And while we see that it does improve standard ventilation levels, standard ventilation levels are still, such as passive house at 0.3 air changes per hour, still insufficient. You're still quite certain you're going to get sick if an infectious person goes in. 20 CFM per hour per person uh, drops somewhat uh, to a lower level, but our three guidelines doubling to 40 CFM per person, MERV-13 filtration for recirculated air, and ultraviolet sanitation. We've now knocked it down to about a third of the probability you'll get sick uh, for an eight-hour exposure. And so this is much, much better than being 90% plus. And, and so that's the basis for our guidelines. So a little bit of talk about um, the airborne debate. I have more slides in the back of this talk with more depth, as well as several references. And those references, of course, lead to references upon references. So you can read as much as you would like. But the CDC and World Health Organization initially just said there were three, uh, two paths uh, that were primary and one that was unlikely, the airborne path. And the airborne path really isn't any different than the droplet path. Uh, the separation is basically a five micron or greater size droplet versus less than that. Presumably five micron droplets drop. They do not. A 10 micron droplet takes about 10 minutes to fall from your nose to the floor. It's very buoyant. It stays in the air for a long time. Somebody walks by, they're walking at a much faster rate than the, the fall rate of that droplet. It's going to get entrained. It's going to move around the room with them. It's going to get on their clothes as they turn around. It doesn't just drop in six feet within seconds. It's in the air for several minutes. And the fomite, the indirect, the surfaces coated with like a cell phone or a hairbrush, 
that this uh, level of contagion, coding different surfaces we might touch or interact with, this uh, the thickness of that contagion coating is dependent on the concentration of contagions in the air, which is then, as we mentioned, directly related to the airflow rate and the recirculation and filtration of airflow. And so fomites, those are impacted by how well we ventilate. And then on top of it, the airborne, the smaller particulates that one might assume just stay levitating and moving around. But it's a much more complicated picture than that, as shown uh, and in part of the references, when someone coughs or sneezes or sings or talks, there's a coherent cloud, just like a smoke ring from somebody smoking a cigarette that, that moves much, much further than six feet. And it stays contiguous and coherent. And when this cloud moves 20 to 30 feet away, this could waft by somebody with a very concentrated cloud of contagion. And so it's a much uh, it's a much more complex situation as clouds of contagion move throughout a room. They don't just simply disperse as as uh, CDC and WHO have been describing. And so I won't go into more detail, but more detail is at the back end of this talk. So let's talk uh, a bit about and show some examples of what air quality looks like in a number of situations. And you might roughly divide buildings from a residence for uh, a low density occupancy, maybe as much as a thousand square feet per occupant. And in those situations, what air quality looks like. Medium density, say more like an office or a school, but where you have maybe about a 10 foot by 10 foot space around you in your cubicle or office or classroom. And, um, and then finally, a high density, more like sitting on a bus in an airplane or other, other place where there's not much volume around you. It's a very dynamic space as far as your breathing and then what you need to do about it. And as much as the airlines tell you they're moving a lot of fresh air in and recirculating a lot, well, some airplanes are, but some aren't. Here's a flight from Philly to Burlington, Vermont. I got sick. This is a very high level of CO2. I was very disappointed. Uh, airlines and aircraft need to have CO2 monitors and pilots who have control over the fresh air need to adjust it based on the occupancy and CO2 is the best way for them to do that. And I work in that industry. I know that industry very well. I design uh, ground control systems, as we'll see, for uh, managing air quality and aircraft when they're on the ground. Here's a low density leaky home, 1950s vintage home. Is the air quality good? No, it's horrible, especially in that gray line, which is where two uh, young children sleep. As soon as they go to bed, uh, you can see the dynamics of air quality. It's much, much more dynamic than in a temperature and humidity in a home much more difficult to control properly. And you can see when they go to bed over an hour or so, uh, it's just skyrocketing. The parents tend to open the bedroom door at about nine after things have quieted down. Um, and then it somewhat levels off, but this is not a good level of air quality. And when one of the children gets sick, the other gets sick, as well as most of the rest of the family. As you can see that this Again, 1950s vintage uh, leaky home, no renovation. It's very uh, similar to the way it was built several years ago. Uh, it just does not have good air quality. It has radiant heating, which is one aspect of not moving air around as well. And so particulates tend to be high. Here is a home that's smart ventilated and the yellow line is the return air to the smart ventilation system that has CO2 and VOC monitoring in it. And when that gets above the set point, which happened to be 850 parts per million of CO2, it triggered uh, fresh air, which would then uh, switch back into a recirculation mode once the indoor air reached 750 parts per million. 
And with three other carbon dioxide monitors placed in the main living room, the master bedroom, and then a typically unoccupied middle bedroom, you can see that there's quite a bit of activity between carbon dioxide in the different rooms and when they're occupied. And, but that with good strong recirculation, that this is able to keep it in control. The highest uh, bedroom level for this data shown is about a thousand parts per million, uh, but but that's uh, a very good level. It, um, as much as we want to keep things say below uh, 900, 850, that's not a uh, that's a very good level compared to today's ventilation standard. When we look at more like a commercial building, and this green line is the carbon dioxide, it's actually a composite of six locations in a 25,000 square foot facility. And, um, and then it's uh, measured over a several day period. And so the line looks fairly smooth. It's quite dynamic, but throughout the building, it had enough air circulation that um, there were not significant differences from one region of the building to another region. 120 employees, the annual utility bill, which was quite high for this size building, but it had computer servers in it. It was a, a information call center for a business located in town here in Champaign-Urbana area. Quite high utility bill, about 90,000 a year. But the payroll is about $6 million a year. We were given access to the utility bills as well as access to measure the air quality. And we found that by the end of the day, air quality was very poor. It started off okay, but with constant flow ventilation uh, at standard ventilation. So if you average this, it actually looked like it was okay in this building, but it wasn't. When people are there, it's polluted as many buildings. And when it's unoccupied, it's overventilated. With active sensing and control, and without any energy recovery um, features added to this building, our detailed energy analysis showed that this building would still have a utility bill of actually somewhat less than $88,000 per year. The utility cost was really unaffected, if not improved, by this better ventilation. Ventilate uh, more highly when people are there basically 40 CFM per person, and then don't ventilate so much when no one's in the building. And basically we found that on a cognitive productivity improvement that they were losing more than 10% of productivity through cognition loss by the levels of CO2 that they were uh, uh, experiencing. And this pales the utility bill in comparison. And even if the productivity, let's say people still waste their time doing this or that instead of being truly productive, if it were only 10% of this level, that's still equivalent to the annual utility bill. And this benefit of improving ventilation to about 40 cubic feet per minute based on Professor Milton's study had a value of 40% sick day reduction or about $60,000 of value, assuming $500 per day sick day cost. So the human resources side of the equation needs to be built into determining air quality and its value. Here's a Illinois Department of Motor Vehicles. You can see that we've been in quite a variety of buildings and people are interested in it. They're trying to understand because you cannot smell good air quality. And in this particular building, um, it has uh, demand control ventilation, a very high occupancy load at different times of the day, very spiky, very hard to control, but with DCV, they could keep it at a building standard, say 1100 parts per million of CO2. And, uh, and while we would now like to see them reduce it more to eight to 900 to improve their health under normal circumstances, as well as today's uh, pandemic situation, uh, basically all they need to do is turn that dial. Here's a house of worship. 
just what you might expect when everybody's there on Sunday or perhaps a Saturday potluck followed by Sunday worship, it goes sky high. And from the charts I showed you, only an hour exposure, you've got a good chance of getting sick if somebody's infectious uh, uh, in that area. So you must increase fresh air, you must reduce the population density, perhaps use other rooms in, in uh, the worship center, and, uh, and then consider other forms like ultraviolet upper room, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, as well as induct or maybe localized filters, uh, room filters, room sanitizers. And here's what I mentioned in aircraft. Uh, we designed and built these big machines that hang underneath. These are 60 to 120 ton uh, air conditioning capacity machines that condition aircraft when they're on the ground at a boarding bridge. And, uh, and basically the forgotten part of the uh, airport is the boarding bridge. It's stagnant air. While we're blowing a lot of air into the aircraft, it exits at the aircraft door. It doesn't go into the boarding bridge. And the security door to the airport, to the terminal gates, that's closed. This is where you're going to get sick. As you can see, uh, carbon dioxide, especially during loading, when we're crowded like cattle cars, it goes sky high. And my recommendation is unless you're flying first class, which I typically don't have the opportunity to do, um, uh, hang back wait until it's not so crowded in there when more air has gotten in and less contagion is likely to be there. Yes, you can have too much fresh air. This beautiful library near here that we studied was having a problem with indoor humidity, high utility bills, and a lot of finger pointing among the architect, the building contractor, and the equipment installer. And things just weren't getting settled. So the library board and the library director um, uh, asked us to come in to assess the situation. And basically, as I showed in that slide, uh, 800 parts per million is about double of current ventilation standards, 20 to 40 CFM. Going to 600 parts per million is doubling again to 80. Going to 500 parts per million is doubling again to 160. They just had too much air per person. And the you basically can't condition all of the outside. So we tuned the building up to where they had six to 700 parts per million. And this was done, as you can see, almost 10 years ago. And we recently went back and, and checked it. And it's maintaining that level of uh, indoor air quality. And interestingly enough, the VOCs also went down because high humidity levels seem to make VOCs more volatile and able to uh, be more prevalent in the air. So uh, we improved the VOC level as well as kept CO2 at desirable levels for, for a good, healthy environment and reduced uh, uh, their energy costs by about two to $3,000 per year. The perfect office, well, we build it at the University of Illinois campus, an undergraduate advising office in mechanical engineering to look at, well, what would it take to put in individualized fresh air with a CO2 VOC set points so the person in this office gets the air quality they want. What a novel idea. Satisfy the person in that indoor space. And a mini split heat pump, a very high efficiency, low temperature heat pump that is uh, rapidly growing on the market these days. And instead of everyone having this window air conditioning unit humming away very inefficiently, this office then was uh, condition the way that person would like. And comfort is very much important in our productivity as well as air quality. And even though we found that in our study with an overall renovation of more than 100 offices in this 100,000 square foot building, that this would save about $5 million in capital costs by avoiding the usual ad duct work to replace all of these individual air conditioning units and better energy savings as well as better productivity. Unfortunately, as academics, we're treated with kind of the ivory tower syndrome, syndrome that we uh, couldn't possibly know what we're doing. And so uh, unfortunately, the facilities people decide to go a different way, a more expensive way, a less healthy way 
a less comfortable way. No, I'm not bitter, but uh, in any case, let's go on. So the costs for doing these things, are they excessive? Doubling the fresh air flow rate without any, without any energy recovery. If it's 68 inside, 32 outside, and go from 20 to 40 CFM per person, that's an increase of about 225 to 450 watts of heat load per person. But going through like a good efficient heat pump that we have available or through some other system, the actual energy usage about 75 to 150 watts and most likely any facilities that you're in has probably switched from incandescent light bulbs to LEDs and has probably already saved at least that much in lighting. So put it toward this additional comfort. But what that really boils down to, rather than simply looking at the facilities and capital costs of that and operational costs, on a per person basis, this is about a penny per hour of operational costs. And again, with no energy recovery. And if it, you are in a place that's got a much lower average outdoor temperature in the winter, maybe that's two cents per hour if you're down around zero degrees for those months when it's very, very uh, cold out, aren't your employees worth two cents per hour? Isn't your health worth two cents per hour? Isn't your cognition, your brain function, your sleep worth two cents an hour? Filler costs, MERV 8 to 13. Oh, now we're not going to have enough fan power to blow through a MERV 13 filter. Well, a study by California Energy Commission showed that really depends on the filter, the pleating design, the material, the manufacturer. And from the study, the investigation they operated, they found MERV-13 filters could have a lower pressure drop than some MERV-8 filters. And the typical pressure drop for typical airflow, about 300 feet per minute, it's about two inches of water. And yes, a MERV-13 filter tends to be more expensive, but you will find when you look online to any of the online stores, Buying 12 of a filter rather than one may be more of a cost savings. That is, one MERV-8 filter may cost more per filter than 12 MERV-13s. And again, if we put that on a per hour person, assuming we change that filter four times per year, and that filter for the airflow rate that gives us this pressure drop would be good for about 20, 21 people that's less than a penny per hour for that filter difference. And the fan power to drive airflow through that relative to not having any filters, that that would be about 0. 0.0004 uh, dollars per hour. So it's tiny. Your health is much more valuable. And then adding ultraviolet. And um, you can look at various costs. I base this roughly on our cost, but then made it very, very conservative, figuring about $60 capital cost per person for the bulb and installation and maintenance a bulb per year. And that comes down to maybe about $10 per person. Again, we're talking a penny per hour for that technology. Here's where I think the important aspect um, what we're missing. And as a young engineer, when I worked in facilities and project engineering, uh, this first line is what would happen when we'd be tasked with uh, adding on to our manufacturing facility, uh, doing something, we'd simply look at capital costs, lifetime maintenance and repair, lifetime utility. The human didn't enter in. But now we do have, uh, this is back in the 70s, but now as of the last 20, 30 years, we understand how employee productivity is impacted by comfort. And for every one degree outside of a person's comfort zone, and no one's comfort zone is like anyone else's, that's a 1% loss of productivity. And that loss increases the further you get away from comfort. You get 10 degrees away, people are sweating bullets or freezing, uh, you're not getting any productivity. So it declines much greater than this. And that 1% loss of productivity at $50,000 a year is 500 bucks. Standard ventilation, odor-based ventilation standards that we currently use, that's basically a 10% cognition productivity. 
And again, the references in the back, uh, a couple of them from Harvard studying cognition productivity and its value. That's about a $5,000 gain. And from their analysis, about a $50 per employee uh, cost in the harsh climate without any, similar to our study, any energy um, recovery features. Now I'm going to just, I'm not going to cover this in detail because I'm seeing I'm running over is, is my habit. I just want to mention as far as the COVID infection trends, here's where the U.S. is today. We have this characteristic linear pathway early in the infection. This is number of infections and we're now screaming past 6 million infections. The summer surge, which was caused by both an increase in temperature in the U.S. that drove people into buildings with low ventilation rates, as well as uh, uh, reopenings that then created situations that transmitted the disease more efficiently. And then somewhat of a slowing as people tried to get in control, but again, kind of a linear path compared to several other countries that have gotten it into control. And yes, they are starting to see some spikes and are getting that in control but they know what to do. And this infection parameter, it's a ratio of the people infected per infectious person over a two week period. So COVID-19, we're basically able to make someone sick, whether we show symptoms or not, but if we're infected over a two week period. And basically uh, infection uh, parameter of three means over a two week period in some manner, my infection has resulted in three other people getting infected. And at a level of 2.72, it's a very mathematical number, the number E, that is a boundary line between accelerated infection growth, which you can see the summer surge occurred Here's where we were in March and April as we were isolating and trying to get control, but still not wearing masks as we started to get control, but lost it. And now we've come back into control with some drop. Um, but now it seems the U.S. tends to move along this boundary. And that boundary is also characterized by a linear growth of infections, as we saw on that. And I just want to mention that that infection parameter has two human behavior things that it's dependent on, two human behavior functions. One is a social distance interaction. And from my earlier talk, from those of you that saw that, we were just learning how to relate that. Now we understand that very well. And basically, this is a, a parameter I get from the University of Maryland. You can look up their social distance index. It's based on anonymous GPS data from people, uh, from cell phones and from vehicle movement. And when that is zero, there's total interaction. And when that goes to 100 or higher, it's perfect isolation. And with perfect isolation, there's no disease transmission and COVID goes away in three weeks. And um, we hit a peak of 60. Normally, we're at about 20. Right now we're at about 27, but with school reopenings, this number's getting lower. That's pushing us in a direction of more infection. But on top of that is an efficiency parameter. Initially, we were at what I defined as an efficiency of one. No face masks, uh, shaking hands, hugging, our normal way of interacting. And um, currently we're at a transmission efficiency of 0.1 to point two, which reflects staying six feet or more away, not going in buildings, ventilation levels starting to increase, um, and other factors like when it's 50 to 70 degrees, we've seen in the data, the infection data, that infection rates go down, and that we ascribe to windows being open, people getting outside more to enjoy the nice weather, which we saw in the spring, and we anticipate again in the fall. But as it gets colder outside below 50 degrees in the fall, we expect to see people go back in and again to see an increase in the transmission efficiency. And these two factors are what uh, determine the infection parameter, whether we're in the accelerated growth or decline. And I'm not going to look at this. I'm just going to simply say we can predict this disease very well. I haven't touched this model 
that I've made since uh, the beginning of July, the end of June, as we went into the surge. I've just plotted new data on it. I've showed what I expect as far as a social distance and the transmission efficiency from now until November, and you can see the data. And this is a very complex curve, but this curve depends on human behavior. We can go way up, or we could have dropped down depending on our behavior. So to summarize, um, these guidelines get more fresh air than what you may have, and carbon dioxide is a way for you to know in a simple manner $150 to $200 to buy that. You can go online, and what I'd recommend is one that has a resolution of 30 to 50 parts per million um, uh, accuracy. And filtration, we'd recommend MERV 13 to 16 with a good level of recirculated air um, to get 90% virus removal. And then air sanitation, uh, ultraviolet is effective. And at this level, it's cost effective as well as improving health. Wear masks when you're in public areas and try to avoid exposure time in unknown, uncertain areas with unknown people. Consider surface ultraviolet germicidal irradiation on top of sanitizing and washing surfaces. This has been shown to take you to another level of reducing contagion on surfaces. Stay more than six feet away from people. The virus is airborne. We understand this disease now, and we understand how personal behavior impacts the disease. So uh, again, thank you to those of you, our essential workers, our frontline people, and medical staff helping to protect us, helping us to continue to function. Use the mask as uh, my Mr. Bean and his minion companion are in this beer garden that uh, should have zero contagion concentration as it has a lovely 398 part per million showing there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ty. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, great. Well, um, real quick, uh, there's a lot of questions. Can you uh, stick yeah. around for a couple of questions with us? Yes, for sure. Yeah, great. Um, and before I get to those questions, just real quick, um, for those of you who got to head out or just so you know, um, live Andes, um, you're going to get that survey pop up when you're done. Please take it, uh, even if you don't need CUs. Uh, it'll also get sent to you an hour later. So check your inbox, check your spam. If you miss it, you can take it then. Um, for those of you watching this on demand uh, at a future later date, take the quiz with an 80% passing rate. Um, you can find the quiz if you're taking it on our YouTube channel by clicking the YouTube link and then heading down on the left side there, clicking show more. And then on the right side, you'll see an access quiz to go to follow the quiz link, take it and submit it there. And before we get into the questions, a huge thanks to our board of directors, um, our volunteers, all of our members, and a huge thanks to our top tier sponsors, uh, Build Equinox for smart ventilation, uh, Mitsubishi for all electric, net zero heat pump technology for your HVAC and Ream for heat pump technology and water heating, the future of water heating and all of our other sponsors. Huge thanks to them for allowing us to do what we do. Um, so yeah, the first question that came in uh, about the UV, and let me make sure I've got it here uh complete because it's a it's a lengthy question i heard that uv light needs to hit the microbes for a certain amount of time to actually kill them how much time is needed i've heard that because of this the uv can work to kill microbes on the coil or filter but not microbes that are still in the hvac airstream um and let me keep there's more to that question sorry about that um in the hvac airstream that's you know moving relatively fast so can you speak to that a little bit Yes, um, uh, a very good question. Uh, the microbes are moving with the airstream and the ultraviolet radiation level that I mentioned, 0.02 watts of ultraviolet power per CFM, uh, roughly with an airstream that would be what you're bringing it through an air handler as we are about 300, 500 feet per minute. That That is sufficient for 85% kill efficiency of 
bacteria, which are actually tougher to kill than a virus, as difficult as it is to catch a viable virus in the air because they're so easy to kill, uh, you know, at the same time, we're having difficulties managing it. But as far as um, some good sources, uh, mm -hmm. Professor William Bonfleff from Penn State, who uh, gave an ASHRAE webinar on ultraviolet use, both in duct as well as um, what's called upper room ultraviolet dermicidal irradiation and then surface sanitation. I recommend uh, watching his webinar. It's very well done. And ASHRAE has, uh, uh, has uh, funded a number of studies on UV sanitation, as well as NIH and, and other medical organizations. There's a study by EPA. I don't have it cited here, but you'll find that in Professor Bonfless's uh, literature, where mm -hmm. they, um, they seeded an airstream with a viable virus, not COVID, but a non-hazardous one, and demonstrated the kill efficiency at different levels of airflow rate, just because of that question of, you know, it's flying through there, is that enough time to, to knock it off? And uh, similarly, uh, Professor Bonfleth addresses and has run, run a lot of research studies on um, coil sanitation and drain pan sanitation, which during summer season when you're dehumidifying is a very important aspect of UV. Yeah, well, that's a great um, segue into my uh, next question, just to kind of focus on um, humidity for a second. Um, so we know that um, from bacteria, viruses, mold, it's good to keep humidity um, and dew point, you know, in a middle, you know, middle of the road area, 50% or so in the relative humidity. Yeah. Um, there's been, uh, you know, from what I can tell, some studies or some conversation that have come out, especially in the beginning, that obviously showed that, you know, humidity, you know, humidity is not going to save us. There was this thought that the summer would come, it would get humid, and it would squash the virus. But isn't there some thought, at least on the on the dryness end, as winter is approaching us, um, that perhaps uh, humidity could actually exacerbate um, the spread, uh, or lack of humidity, dryness, could actually exacerbate the spread of COVID-19, or make it worse if you catch it. So if you're living, if you get it and you're in a very dry you know, and you don't have humid, hum, good humidity control in your office or wherever you're at your home. Have you seen anything like that or heard anything on that end, at least on the on the dry side? Yes, there's a lot of speculation, but it is an unknown. And humidity is a very tough question because, um, and I have a reference in that list from, there's a very recent review, uh, spring of 2020, and, and they mentioned COVID, although, we don't know directly yet on COVID, but uh, respiratory viruses like influenza and cold viruses and cold, some cold viruses are a close relative of coronavirus. They are coronaviruses, but of a different nature that uh, influenza seems to be very sensitive to humidity. That is, it's viable at lower levels of humidity. And so one of the reasons why it goes away in the summertime is a higher level of humidity tends to drop it. But we know that people do catch the flu down south where humidity levels aren't like they are in more northern levels. And so it's not exclusive. And then other exacerbating factors, which uh, these authors, I'm sorry, I forget uh, the names of the co-authors, but an excellent review on respiratory viruses, that other factors like too dry of uh, air in buildings in the winter, it makes it so that mucus layer in your respiratory system, so the cilia that are continually bringing up particulates and contagions inside your, uh, uh, your airways, that uh, that layer gets thinner with lower humidity and it's not as effective or as big of a barrier for contagions and to get embedded into the cells and then for a virus to have a host cell to replicate in. Um, but it's all over the map. There's some stuff that seems to do better in high humidity, some at low, 
COVID seems to not care about temperature or humidity. Uh, and But this is unknown. If it increases as we go into winter and due to humidity levels, but so far correlating studies don't point to that as too strong of a factor for COVID, uh, but it's very sparse data at this point. That transmission efficiency factor that I mentioned, that will increase because basically that's saying that maybe instead of this far apart, you go this far apart and you have the same efficient efficiency level to move the, the contagion from this person to that person. Um, so a, a very good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer. Oop, I, I lost you on the- There we go. I have a, another question on humidity. Um, you were mentioning that uh, in that library example that they were having humidity issues because of overventilation. Um, so I guess here's my question. If somebody is not ventilating at all, poor ventilation, but they're also having humidity issues, is there a risk by introducing, you know, ventilation to the standard we'd all hope it would be at, would exacerbate those uh, current humidity issues that they're having that are not related to uh, ventilation at all? Well, you were breaking up a little bit at the end of that, Brett. If you could repeat, please. Yeah, what I was saying is, um, if you start to add, you know, ventilation where we want it, you want it to be 40 to 50, uh, and the, the, you know, the the building's already suffering from humidity issues that aren't related to ventilation. Could it make it worse by moving it to the ventilation you want it to be, or does ventilation only become a problem when it starts to pass the level that you're suggesting, the sort of 40 to 50? So um, on our website, we've got a four report series that we did on humidity management and whether you're in a leaky homes are the worst they're energy inefficient you're going to have bad air and you're going to have uncontrolled humidity problems that are going to cost you when you try to control it through de active dehumidification uh, you, you want to build a home as tight as possible and passive house levels like 0.6 ACH um, uh, at 50 pascals that's a good level to shoot for one is very good um, and when you build a house like that and then you ventilate it smart bring in the air you need when you need it and at the levels we recommend whether you're in florida or alaska uh, you can manage the humidity now the humidity changes so in a florida your dominant say cooling load may be latent rather than sensible and when it shifts, say, more than, um, when your latent load becomes more than maybe 30% or so of the total cooling load, that gets to be um, at the upper end of what, uh, say, a mini split heat pump or a geothermal heat pump can pull out of the air uh, without overcooling the space. And that's the point when you would then bring in um, uh, a dehumidifier. Uh, whether uh, a room dehum de or uh, some other humidifier. And, uh, but the cost for running that is quite low. And, and again, this report series, this four report series, the first goes through moisture loads. The second goes through climatic variations and how that impacts moisture throughout the US. I mean, very extensive amount of climatic data. The third then goes into the machines that we use to manage moisture, at least this day and age, from um, typical air conditioners, uh, ventilation units, such as uh, what we have incorporated a heat pump, since that also then contributes to dehumidification, but also uh, real data, as well as information on heat pump water heaters, which is a critical piece of the equation for a high efficiency home. Every high efficiency home that wants hot water should have a heat pump water heater, whether it's Nome, Alaska or Florida. Uh, and then finally, dehumidifiers. So uh, that third report describes the energy usage, the effectiveness of pulling water out of the air in a variety of climates, 
And then finally, the fourth report puts the whole ball of wax together. It's a few hundred pages of basically lowering your metabolism so you can sleep if, if your air quality is keeping you awake at night. Um, so, you know, we understand humidity. It's not a problem when you build right. And if you still have a moisture problem like the military has in all of its privatized housing, it's a horrendous situation for our service personnel. There's reasons for that, like dripping uh, condensate pans, uh, plumbing leaks, sweating leaks, uh, sweating. Uh, you need to fix that problem. And then under typical human load and human activities and climatic variation, we know how to manage it and we know how to do that well in every climate. Um, so let's talk a little bit about point source. Um, uh, and it wasn't uh, um, specifically part of your recommendations. So the question is, what are your thoughts on sort of these sort of room by room standalone air purification systems? Yes, uh, a very important uh, tool to use since you know, a retrofit or renovation is more expensive uh, and long-term. And uh, colleagues of mine at the University of Illinois, Professor Helen Wynn uh, and, uh, and her colleague, Professor uh, Vishal Verma in civil and environmental engineering. And I'd recommend looking on their site. Um, they, uh, they have been studying this problem they have been, uh, over the past couple of months, going to different office classroom spaces as people have been coming back and opening up. And what they do is they look at the microbial uh, situation in that room before. And, uh, and so they, you know, using modern tools, it's, it's very amazing how you can see the DNA and RNA of whatever's floating around in the air uh, in rapid time. They're assessing uh, those microbes before and then after placing uh, a room uh, filter or sanitizing unit of various sorts. And they're finding that these are very, very effective ways to deal with that. And uh, so again, Professor Helen Wynn and Professor Vishal Verma, and recently they made national news where they showed that one could sanitize a face mask in like a crock pot or a magic pot by setting it at about 180, 200 degrees and under dry heat. Um, they made, you know, world headlines, you know, all the big newspapers and outlets, but showing a very simple manner that they could uh, sanitize face masks from similar type of viruses. So they spiked it with live viruses, but of a non-lethal nature. And, um, and so I, I recommend people looking on their website to get more information on that. It's very exciting work and very important work. Um, and specific to this question, did they uh, use any handheld over-the-counter ultraviolet lights, or do you have any thoughts on those? I, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, haven't, I don't think they've done that yet. Uh, others have asked me, and I don't know the efficacy of that. Uh, that's a very good question. With my own face mask, uh, and I'm fortunate to have a daughter that's a prolific sewer, and so I've got face masks for every day. I, I wash mine out with soap and water, and then I place it outside in the sunlight. To and I guess I meant to say more um, just your recommendations on handheld UVs for surfaces, like to stop viral spread, like in buildings. and Yeah. Uh, yes, so there's a, and I think I have that in my list, I'm almost certain I have that in my list of references from one study, but there's others where the surface sanitizing, um, this uh, medical facility in Vancouver studied 700 isolated patient rooms over the course of a year, 700 occupancies, but multiple rooms, and they looked at the microbial loading, the fomites, uh, the surfaces laden with contagion before they were washed with disinfectant, after they were washed, and then after one of these UV surface sanitizing systems um, was placed in the room. And they found that they went from about, say, 30, 35% of surfaces having contagion, uh, traces of contagion on them before washing 
to say just under 30%. So it's quite surprising that they still found a significant, significant fraction of surfaces that have been washed that still have traces of contagion on them. And then when the ultraviolet surface sanitizing systems were brought in, and basically it's a big bank of light bulbs, and some are fancy as robots, others you just manually wheel in, but a bunch of vertical fluorescent looking tubes. You don't want anybody in the room when this thing goes in and does its thing, because it's very uh, harmful to us too. Um, but with the, the typical dosage, say in this room for 15, 20 minutes, that room, they found a drop to only two to three percent of surfaces showing contagion levels in it a remarkable almost factor of 10 drop and i don't i'm not so familiar with that technology it's mainly in the medical industry now and i'm sure that's selling like gangbusters and backlogged in ordering but i could see classrooms and restaurants and others picking up that technology to uh, add another layer of protection. And, and one of the things about, say, our guidelines, um, anybody looking at, at what we've uh, said from day one, but really over the past 10 years is that even if, uh, you know, one of the difficulties when you implement a guideline, you know, you maybe go to this expense and then you don't have an infection, but the question is, would you have had an infection otherwise without it? And, and so as people grapple with that, but the nice thing about these guidelines is that these are really pre-COVID guidelines. They've been in ASHRAE and elsewhere and in our studies for a long time. And you will see a drop in sick days by going to the ventilation level that we've said. Now you personally may still get sick, but just like the difference between weather and climate, while predicting individual weather is very difficult, and uh, but predicting the climate, you know, we can do that with certainty and spread over a large number of people. We will see sick days of colds and influenza drop by improving ventilation. We will see brain function and sleep improve with the improved ventilation, and that's got value apart from helping us protect ourselves from COVID. So it's kind of an interesting situation that these improvements should have been happening in any case. And now this addition of ultraviolet, which again is decades old, there's some newer technologies that still need some research to understand their viability and how to design. But you will improve the healthiness of those building spaces that, that you're involved in with these guidelines. Well, talking about that, um, you know, I was looking at the handheld device you were showing for um, monitoring CO2, which sounds really helpful if you're really concerned, you want to take it around with you. I saw you were using it on the plane. Um, and obviously, something like that seems really helpful for an auditor or an assessor who's going and looking at buildings and evaluating them. But uh, for the price tag, I was wondering, you know, I, I've been seeing more of these um, devices come on the market that can monitor all sorts of air quality things that you can put in your office or your home. Here's one that I just pulled up the data for that I have. I don't know if you can see that. It's yeah. very bad news um, <laughs> for me. Haven't done my ventilation improvement yet. But, yeah, you know, right. what that? Get yeah. out now. I know, escape now, and I'm about to fall asleep here. Like, <laughs> but, uh, but people become panic stricken, but uh, it's good information. So you start feeling your bearings and that that's actually standard you know yeah so i mean do you recommend like you know cost comparisons i mean do you think these little devices coming out on the market that are given this data are helpful useful can oh, give yeah. us that information we need to improve ventilation yeah I, very definitely i i think uh anybody that you know like a facilities manager goes around to all the buildings and spaces and, and takes and measures airflow which is important and good to do yeah but Hitting themselves that now because they've set it to this many CFM for this room, that room, or that room, that the air quality is going to be good when people are there. You need to look at CO2 to see if the population loading relative to the ventilation is appropriate. And it's like squeezing jello, it may be good here, but it pops out over there. And, um, and CO2 to me is the way you sniff that out, just like the boarding bridge in an airport, kind of a forgotten space, but 
but I'm sure that's where a lot of infections are uh, getting seeded. And I wanted to thank one of our um, attendees for one-upping me. They were at 1325 ppm CO2 with their device. They said just now. <laughs> we recently traveled, and we traveled safely. You saw, you know, some of my grandkids with face masks in that one picture. Uh, their mom gave me approval to show that picture. But we stayed in a motel, a hotel with very good ratings. Uh, the lobby was at about 1,200. Uh, uh, parts per million, so you know, typical ventilation. Our room uh, where my wife and I stayed was about 1,200. In the morning, it was 3,400. This is what happens in a bedroom. Basically, the fresh air ventilation was non-existent in that room. And uh, uh, now, since we're free of contagion, uh, and and I've tested probably about six times. I'm very fortunate that the University of Illinois has the most advanced. COVID testing system anywhere in the world. We're running 2% of all COVID tests here at the University of Illinois uh, uh, in the US. And, uh, and, and basically it's a spit test. You walk in, you spit in a vial on your app. Uh, later in the day, it tells you, okay, now you have access to buildings again. And all students, faculty and staff test twice a week. That's what we need throughout the country. But if you're not infected and you know in your bubble are those people you associate with, they're responsible, you're not going to catch it. And so even though it was 3,400, which I was very, very disappointed with as far as waking up and finding the air quality at that level, um, I wasn't going to get sick from that. You know, just probably a poor night's sleep. Right, right. Um, and then one quick last question before we wrap up, if you guys still have a second. Um, does, is there any, I mean, any studies or anything you know about, um, you know, UV being added to our HVAC systems, uh, either degrading the system or the filter, filter faster or anything like that? So it's a very important question, and that's why we took two years to basically run UV bulbs in in our unit just to see whether or not our sealants or other things that weren't directly in line with it but would still receive a dose of radiation. And over the course of a year, examining the material degradation, we were real pleased to see that, you know, most of it's aluminum. You know, we have aluminum ducts. Uh, aluminum heat exchangers, other aluminum surfaces, aluminum uh, uh, coated uh, tapes. But where we did have uh, ultraviolet resistant caulks uh, and some other, say, foam tapes or sealants, we we didn't see degradation uh, in that. Uh, so that you know, over the life of our warranty, five years, uh, we don't expect to see any problems. But it's important to test that and for sure keep polymers out of the way of it. They will disappear with ultraviolet. And so a lot of polymer heat exchangers that are used in energy recovery, most likely those are not good candidates for sanitizing with ultraviolet. You want to go downstream if you have flex duct, put in a section that's long enough that the ultraviolet as it moves down the duct, but you do want it looking in the duct and reflecting off of it. So using an aluminum section of duct, but in some manner having it long enough so it's not able to see into, say, a flex duct made out of some polymer that, you know, typically will degrade in that type of light. Great. Well, um, Ty, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us and, and updating us and enlightening us on this very important and timely topic. Um, and actually, someone I wanted to leave you with a great comment. Um, you know, again, they were just saying this is a great seminar. Thank you. And they were asking, you know, or encouraging you to get the word out at school districts. Seems like it'd be very important with everyone going back to school right now. Um, so just leaving you with that as encouragement. Um, for our purposes, anybody can, this will be available online for free. So if people want to send it to school administrators, share it out. Please send it to them. Uh, and I assume, Ty, they at either school districts or any one of our attendees can contact you to learn more. Um, so where would that be if they wanted to reach out to you? Yeah, so at uh, buildequinox.com, 
ty at buildequinox.com to get a hold of me directly. And, and there are some excellent groups while we're focused on, you know, our ventilation system, but uh, I'm connected with a lot of folks in the industry and at the University of Illinois, we have a group called CDAC, mm -hmm. Smart Energy Design Assistance Center. They recently held uh, a webinar uh, that Professor Wynn and myself and, and some of their staff conducted, uh, directed toward institutional and schools uh, especially. But um, so there are good resources. There's a lot of people active in it, and um, and it's in all our interest, best interest to uh, get us all on the right page on this. And thank you Great. everybody for participating. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Take care. Stay safe out there. Stay masked. Stay away. And we'll all see you in person, hopefully for a nice conference next year. So bye bye. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.